This is a production of Cornell University. Uh, Julie is the Fruit IPM Coordinator with Cornell's Cooperative Extension's New York State IPM program. She holds a PhD in plant pathology and plant molecular biology from a university, Cornell University, okay, and an MS from University of Massachusetts and a BS in botany from the University of Maine. Her job as a fruit IPM coordinator is to deliver IPM knowledge to fruit growers and develop ways for them to adopt IPM so that they can help grow healthy fruit crops with minimal pesticide inputs. On a personal level, Julie and I have been collaborators since my first day in Cornell and back in 2006. She's been an important mentor for all of my extension and applied research endeavors throughout my entire career. Working together as a team, we've been able to greatly improve the uh, disease forecasting systems for Apple and the newest system. We've worked so much on really doing a lot to improve the fruit production guidelines, pesticide database systems, and um, greatly enhanced all of the um, re outreach and the reach and the success of my uh, antimicrobial resistance surveys for numerous fruit pathogens. And finally, even though she'd uh, mentioned wanting to do this back in 2006, we finally completed those fact sheet redrafts and we did it with feeling. Without any further ado, let's welcome Julie to present her story on Dutch elm disease to hummingbirds, a woman's guide to plant pathology. Thank you so much, Carrick, and thank you all for being here. Um, so let's get started. A little bit about me. So I lived in about 10 places growing up went to eight schools, K through 12. I actually finished high school as a junior. Um, my dad was in the Air Force. I was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, which is like right here. And then we moved to uh, Wichita Falls, Texas, and then to Clinton, Oklahoma. That's why I learned how to ride horses. And then we moved to Upper Peninsula, Michigan, and that's why I learned how to toboggan. Wow, that is a lot of fun. Um, we moved from there to Fairfax, Virginia, where I learned some diplomacy. And from there, we zoomed down to Central America. We lived in Guatemala City for three and a half years, where I was the fastest freestyle swimmer for all of those years in Guatemala. And then from there, we moved to Tegucigalpa, Honduras. From there, my dad was transferred. Oh, no, all the way up to Loring Air Force Base, Maine, which is a decommissioned Air Force Base at this point in time. So, uh, and that was in March, pretty cold up there compared to Tegucigalpa. So uh, finished high school and went to get my bachelor's in Orono um, and then master's degree at UMass. And after that, I landed a job at Cornell Ithaca as the diagnostician and 4-H specialist. After a few years there, I got a PhD in plant pathology. After that, I did some freelancing for APS K through 12 enrichment in a program we were calling at the time Plant Pathways to Science. And then I did a couple postdocs at Agritech in Geneva and then landed the fruit IPM coordinator job in 2001. So at UMaine, I was able to learn about Dutch elm disease. In high school, I learned that American elms had a disease and I had to help them. I love trees. Dr. Richard Campana had a successful integrated management program for Dutch elm disease. And I worked with him and his PhD student at the time, Janet Anderson. The integrated program basically involved spraying for bark beetles, the vectors of the fungus, surveying for strikes, which are branches that you can see up in the crown of the trees that are wilting and turning yellow, injecting infected trees or even prophylactically with systemic fungicides around the trunk. And that was the research that Janet was involved with on the microorganisms that were colonizing those injection wounds. And I helped her with that work. Another aspect of controlling this disease involves destroying root grafts because the fungus can travel down the xylem vessels into the roots and into another adjacent American elm that has a root graft with it. And then of course, removing dying and dead trees. 
This picture is the Campana Elm, named in honor of Dick Campana. The Campana Elm is still alive today at the University of Maine campus, and their website says that it may be older than the university itself. And did you guys know that a Dutch group of scientists elucidated this disease? There are no Dutch elms that grow, no. It's called Dutch elm disease because of the Dutch scientists. And a Dutch woman scientist, Marie Beatrice Schwartz, isolated the fungus from diseased elms in Europe and proved it to be the cause of the disease a little over a hundred years ago. Over 40 million American elms have died from this disease in the US. I went on to study maple decline at the University of Massachusetts with Dr. Terry Tatter in the Shade Tree Laboratories. And what I was doing was correlating root starch as shown by these iodine stains with tree crown condition. This crown is healthy and this crown is in severe decline. And what we were trying to do is to develop an easy assay that urban foresters could use to gauge tree health. And this would aid their decisions on whether to literally just remove this tree or do pruning in the crown to remove the dead and dying branches and then fertilize it and try to bring it back. <clears throat> Here you can see a root cross section stained with iodine that has tons of starch. So it would be high. And here you have low to depleted starch in the wood of the tree. Now all woody plants store carbohydrate in their roots primarily over the winter. And so it's a really great way to know how healthy the plants are. They mobilize this starch in the spring as buds start to grow and up until the leaves are photosynthetically active, that stored starch is what the trees are relying on. And even such plants as grapevines. And you can see here the correlation that we found between tree crown condition and root starch content. Uh-oh, I think I'm doing what Carrick was saying. <laughs> Let's wait for the program to respond. So the no. next slide I'm going to show you about the insect and plant disease diagnostic lab at Cornell University. Here I am on a typical summer day in the lab with all these plant samples. This was a little growth chamber area I created on a work uh, on a bookcase. And here I am surrounded with plant materials. Yellow walls, you might ask. Well, before I moved into this lab, the walls were painted yellow because it was thought that that color was more pleasant for a woman. And it's interesting the way things have changed a little bit for women over the last hmm, 40 years since I've been here at Cornell. But those cheery walls brightened my days on innumerable years as I was working in the diagnostic lab. So here are some statistics for you for 1987. And I, ex I expect Sandy can relate to this. So I got approximately 1,500 total inquiries that year. About 1,300 of those were actually samples that needed to be diagnosed. 845 of those proved to be biotic diseases and the remainder 400 or so abiotic diseases. In addition, I received 43 letters. And yes, these were letters on paper in an envelope with a postage stamp delivered by the US Post Office. And I had to decipher the handwriting on some of those letters. And I became very good at it over the years. We also got in 14 mushrooms for identification and 71 phone calls. You know, 71 phone calls, that's nothing compared to the likely number of email inquiries that are being fielded these days by the Plant Disease Diagnostic Lab in plant pathology. <clears throat> 
some interesting finds. Alfalfa mosaic came in on this Swedish ivy plant, causing these etched ring patterns. And Rosi Providenti at the Geneva campus, then called the Ag Experiment Station, helped me identify this disease and we published a plant disease note. Early days, I think it was probably 1982 or so, I got this Persian violet sample in and it had this dieback. I actually propagated it and thought, oh, I can take some of these home, which I was often doing, bringing rescue plants home to plant as house plants or in my yard. But every single one of those cuttings that rooted, all of them died of this disease. And it turned out to be a Tospo virus, what is now known as impatience necrotic spot virus on this Persian violet plant. A quarantine level disease we handled a lot was bacterial blight of geranium. So let's look at the clientele. Most of the samples that I would get in were from Cornell Cooperative Extension people. And then from horticultural inspectors, those are the people that would send me these bacterial blight samples. We also got things directly in from homeowners, about 145 of the total for 1987. And then 203 commercial samples would come in, potentially from turf grass managers. You can see turf grass samples here or from um, White Flower Farm in Connecticut, that type of thing. And then 41 of those samples were from people on campus, sometimes researchers who had diseases that were affecting their subject plants that they were doing experiments with. Most of the commodities that we got in were woody ornamentals, which was good for me because of my background in woody plants. Then florist and foliage followed by field crops, then vegetables and herbs or herbs, sorry about that and then turf grass and fruits. Ironically, I work in fruits now, and those were the lowest numbers that we would get samples of. Of course, the overwhelming majority of the biotic diseases were caused by fungi, then followed by bacteria with 97, 40 that year were viruses, and then interestingly, four were phytoplasma, three were nematodes, and two were parasitic plants. During that time, I also was the 4-H plant pathology specialist for Cornell. And this allowed me to interact with people who were doing programs for kids and also with the kids themselves. And I really pride myself on increasing the participation in plant pathology projects during the years that I was working in 4-H for the department. We typically saw the highest 4-H participation associated with 4-H projects that involved schools, like the Sick Talking Plant Project that was developed by my predecessor, Wix Westcott. And here I am in, a tr in one of these teacher training sessions, showing them all how to do some of the associated exercises that went along with the Sick Talking Plant Project. These 4-H project bulletins were ones that I either developed from scratch, know your, plant, know your plant's disease and know your tree diseases. And I also revised the Fun with Fungi bulletin. Here's an activity that was in Know Your Plant's Diseases. Find the plant disease symptoms. And of course, it's an apple tree with just about every symptom known to human beings. Probably one of the most exciting things that I did was I increased participation in the Fun with Fungi project during a Cornell Cooperative Extension Regional In-Service Education Program. We would travel across the state and meet with the 4-H agents in each county in different regions. And people told me, oh, Julie, you'll never be able to get that person to do fun with fungi or anything plant pathology. He only does course programs in 4-H. 
aha, uh -huh. well, I knew how to ride. And so I said to him, I said, well, you know, how about practicing dismounting and remounting while keeping the horse under control and collecting mushrooms while you're out on the trail? And sure enough, that year, he did just that with his 4-Hers and ended up sending mushroom collections to the state fair for exhibits. So every year we would rate exhibits at the state fair. And this happens to be an exhibit that I developed. And I took uh, Vivian Miao, a graduate student at the time, and Sri Rama Bailey, a postdoc at the time, with me to state fair so they could experience the New York State Fair with me. After the diagnostic lab, I took time off and I got a PhD on wheat spindle streak mosaic virus. And that was with Dr. Gary Bergstrom and Dr. Stuart Gray, who was in the virology and nematology lab. So most of my work was in the VN lab. Here's the Gary Bergstrom program at the time, Gary, me, much younger, of course, both of us, and a couple of his graduate students, his technician, and a visiting scientist at the time. And this is the directory of the VN lab that my son decided the VN lab needed because it did not have a pictorial staff directory like the plant science department had. So he created these images of all of the VN scientists. So during that time, this is a picture of the disease. It's a great picture that Gary took. Um, I'm, I've been and will continue to be fascinated by virus symptoms on plants. We created a Wussum V antiserum. We documented the natural cycle of infection of winter wheat. It's a soil-borne virus that infects over the winter and then movement into the leaves occurs in the spring and symptom expression later on. I also advanced the understanding of virus resistance in winter wheat through mechanical and soil inoculations of different wheat breeding lines and cultivars with known resistance levels. We grew the putative vector polymyxograminous in axenic culture in a flooding system but unfortunately, I was unsuccessful in transmitting the virus with the zoospores of this uh, organism, polymyxograminous. Here's an electron micrograph of the purified WSSMV preparation. Here I am collecting samples um, in the winter time. And this is my son helping me interpret my scientific data. After my PhD, I took some time off because actually when I was defending my PhD, I was so pregnant with my twins that I think the people in my committee meeting were a little bit quite nervous about the whole thing because I was really quite big. And after that, the cost of daycare was essentially prohibitive and it really didn't make sense to put two babies and a seven-year-old into daycare and have only about $50 left per week. But in any case, I did some freelance work for APS on K through 12 enrichment during that time. And also worked for the National Association of Biology Teachers on developing a monograph titled Learning Biology with Plant Pathology. My colleagues on the Youth Programs Committee of APS, this committee is no longer active, um, helped me with the exercises in this monograph. And here I am at the NABT meeting. We had an APS booth at that meeting. And we also at the national APS meetings would have teacher enrichment programs at each meeting. Again, we were trying to get a teacher training effort going based at Cornell University called Plant Pathways to Science, but it was not selected for funding by NSF, unfortunately. And here I am interacting with the children of faculty and postdocs in basically testing out some of these approaches to 
teaching plant pathology to younger audiences. After that, I did a postdoc with Dr. Wayne Wilcox up in Geneva. I also did another postdoc after this one with Georgia Bowie, but I'm not gonna go into any of the data from that. That was on carrot leaf blights. This postdoc focused on grapevine powdery mildew, and we did four different projects for this. This particular project was probably the most well-known. Um, it studied the effect of relative humidity on grapevine powdery mildew development. We found 85% relative humidity as the optimum. We used saturated salt solutions in these growth chambers inside a growth room, wherein air was pumped through water, through the saturated salt, and into the chamber, and a data logger tracked the temperature and relative humidity inside the chamber during the run of the experiment. We found that as RH increases relative humidity, and we also looked at absolute humidity and vapor pressure deficit, and the results are essentially the same. Severity increases up to about 85%. Disease sporulation intensity increases up to about 85%. Disease incidence also increased. I'm not showing those data slides. And then spore germination increased as well. This experiment was done on microscope slides. And then up to about 85% relative humidity. And after that, germination declined precipitously. We also looked at a disease severity gradient next to Lake Erie. Here's the cliff face next to Lake Erie, and here are the oak trees on the edge of that cliff face, and here's the vineyard moving away from the lake. We had data loggers positioned in and along five different plots moving away from the lake with pot, plot one being closest, plot five being furthest from the lake. Basically, three-fold higher cluster powdery mildew disease severity, as you can see in this slide, would occur closer to Lake Erie in plot one as compared to plot five. And we found that from pre-bloom to five millimeter berry size, the time when the, the fruit is at greatest risk of infection, its susceptibility is highest, for pathogen infection, that it was warmer during the day, closer to the lake, here's zero difference, and here's about half a degree difference all day long, closer to the lake, and then at sunset, that temperature difference dropped significantly and very quickly, so that it was one degree colder, closer to the lake, which of course, those of you who understand relative humidity, means that there's a spike in relative humidity closer to the lake compared to further away. We also looked at two fungicides, monopotassium phosphate and JMS stylid oil. We wanted to know what the mode of action of monopotassium phosphate was, and we wanted to know the effect of JMS stylid oil on bricks. So we used for the monopotassium phosphate experiment these in exclusion chambers that scrubbed the air in the greenhouse before pushing that air through these chambers. Any of you who have grown plants that are susceptible to powdery mildew in a greenhouse setting know that it is everywhere. Powdery mildew loves greenhouse conditions. And here you can see plants that were taken out of those chambers Chardonnay sprayed three days after inoculation with MKP has no powdery mildew, whereas the vines sprayed with water have powdery mildew colonies developing on the inoculated leaves. So we found that monopotassium phosphate is an eradicant at three to seven days post inoculation, that it had no protectant activity and it also had antisporulant activity, although I'm not sharing those data with you right now. 
my twin daughters decided that they were going to check out these exclusion chambers so that they could show you at the time I took this picture how big these exclusion chambers were. So they're about big enough to fit in a three-year-old toddler. In terms of JMS Stylet Oil and its effect on bricks, we found that late season sprays with this material could reduce bricks by one degree, but that early season sprays do not. Those of you who make wine or who grow wine grapes or even juice grapes know that one degree bricks can be really significant, especially in our climate. It can be a make or break as to whether your grapes may be accepted at a processor. It's basically determining the soluble solids in the grapes, which is correlated with carbohydrate content or sugars. All of the fungicides in this trial reduced the number of casmothecia formed on the leaf surfaces. And I chose to regress all of that disease severity data that I had against the number of chiasmothesia. The name was changed from Cleistothesia to Chiasmothesia during the interim of when I did this work and today. So I'm trying to you know, use the updated language for this. But it basically showed this regression analysis that as little as 4% leaf area infected could lead to fully formed chasmothesia on the leaf surface, indicating that it's pretty tough to prevent that life cycle of powdery mildew from moving forward year to year. Then on to the New York State IPM program. I have worked 20 phenomenal years in fruit IPM. The IPM program is an exceptional program with exceptionally talented people and a fun place to work. Here I am, in the year when I started working there. This is a picture taken of our program um, not too many years ago, nicely dominated by women. This is my technician, uh, one of the field technicians that I had, Nicole Mattoon, and we're checking traps in an apple orchard. And this is what your program can do with cool pictures when you're all away at the IPM symposium and it's just the webmaster who's a great graphic designer left with uh, folks in the lab. So one of the first things I did when I got my job in IPM was I went out and I talked to growers to find out, okay, what are your needs? What are the key things that are happening for you related to IPM? And at one of these, an apple grower said, I need Cornell to create a program that can fill out all of the processor forms with my spray records that I have to fill out every year before I can sell my fruit to anybody. And I just laughed and I said, well, you know, I'm not a programmer. I don't think I can do that. But when I took these results from all these visits across the state back to the IPM director at the time, Mike Hoffman, he said, that's what you should do. And here's $20,000, go do it. So we did. Um, I hired a technician, Judy Nedro, at the time to help me develop this software, and we did absolutely develop it. And it is able to do exactly what the grower wanted and more. Indeed, at a presentation I was giving last week, the growers in the audience said, so Julie, you're retiring. What's going to happen with track software? Who's going to carry that forward? And I told them that I'm seeking emeritus status. And my hope is that I can bring this software up and grow it into the latest IT. This software licenses are distributed through the Center for Technology Licensing at Cornell University. And there are six iterations of the software for different crops, and it's also available for turf grass. The next series of slides are just going to be some screen captures. I realize that these are very retro, very old version of Excel, but the 
program still essentially works the same way. There's a chem table, which now is open so the grower can keep their own pesticide inventory with all of the information they need about these pesticides that they are using. And they can also include the unit that is applied and the cost for the available for that particular unit. So their unit cost. The farm spray records are kept on the spray data sheet and the farm data is actually populated on other sheets and it basically potentiates drop down lists so that all their varieties are in the program and they can choose whichever variety from these drop down lists, making it really easy to fill out their spray records. The drop down lists from the, K, from the chem table populate the pesticide trade name drop down list. And here I'm going to select dithane. And all of this information is going to fill in automatically simply by selecting that trade name. And then if they know the cost and they know how much they've applied, which obviously they do, the program calculates the cost of that application for them per acre. And after releasing Track Apple, I can remember a grower from the Champlain Valley coming into my office saying, Julie, Track Apple is great, but you know what? The person in my office doesn't believe that I actually spent $7,000 on Sovereign this year, but actually they had. Um, so pesticides are expensive and they don't just apply them for any old reason. The other thing this does is it fills out the US EPA worker protection standard form. Everything here in these columns is required, but track goes a step further and calculates the safe re-entry date and re-entry time for the farm workers. Here's a processor form that gets filled out with all of the sprays. And um, you know, then they can print that out and send it to their buyer. Carrick alluded to NUA, the Network for Environment and Weather Applications. And I started working on NUA when there were about 45 weather stations, mostly around Geneva and in Western New York. And during the 11 years that I was leader, we grew the network to over 500 stations in 11 different states. And now there are over 850 weather stations that are driving plant disease forecasts, insect phenology tools, crop management tools, <clears throat> and weather data tools. We just launched a new device-friendly website that renders on your phone just as well as it renders on a desktop, laptop, or tablet computer. And the thing I'm most excited about is when you've got 850 weather stations and all these state partners, you know that you have a lot of weather stations and locations to sort through if you're a user. So the user can set up a NUA dashboard with the tools they want from the weather stations they want. They set up their login, number one. They set up their profile, number two. And number three, this shows the dashboard with the current conditions at that weather station, the forecast, and also a summary of the result from the forecast tool that shows up on their dashboard. And so you guys can go up, go on to NUA and set up your own dashboard for things that you want to see. It's as easy as one, two, three. And we did a survey of NUA in 2017, this is pretty exciting. So on average, the growers responding to this survey are saving $4,300 per year from reducing pesticide sprays, $33,000 per year by preventing crop loss. And their average annual per acre savings was estimated by the people on this survey to be $2,100. All the growers agreed strongly or agreed, period, that NUA can reduce sprays, 
improve spray timing, inform them about pest risk, and enhance their IPM practices. And the key, really cool thing, this shows you all of the new Apple models that we currently have for insects, uh, crop management, and diseases. And what two were the most often used? Hey, Carrick, look at this. Fire blight and apple scab. So pretty awesome. Every survey respondent that was using NUA currently said that they would recommend NUA to other growers. So we're pretty excited about that system for IPM. A research project that I did in IPM was on bacterial canker of sweet cherry. Basically, the focus of my work initially was to determine if the copper sprays that were being recommended by the horticulturalists to be applied before and after pruning were actually doing anything at all. Um, so basically, we found out that not only was copper ineffective at protecting the pruning cuts, but so were phosphite sprays. And Carrick helped me on this phosphite work. Um, and we found no difference, essentially, in canker progression down a pruning stub with these sprays. We did find the use of pruning stubs actually protected the trunks of the trees and the scaffolds that those limbs were attached to. They protected them from canker invasion. And leaving pruning stubs is now standard practice in New York cherry orchards, not only sweet cherry, but also tart cherry, even though tart cherry is much less susceptible to this disease caused by Pseudomonas syringi, Pathovirus syringi, and Morse prunorum. We looked at the timing of pruning, and we found that pruning after harvest was the best timing and reduced canker progression the most. And you can see that on this chart, here is the July post-harvest pruning treatment and the extent of canker in centimeters. And this is the March, April, and May pruning timings. Here you can see a picture of a stub pruned in March. The canker has progressed down this far and one pruned in July after harvest and the canker has progressed really not very far at all. And we wanted to make sure that it wasn't uh, something that like next spring wasn't going to carry over. So we actually flagged those and measured them again in spring of the following year. Obviously a grower that is leaving stubs wants to make sure that that's not just gonna become blind wood. So we looked at whether those stubs would produce new lateral growth and indeed all of them do, which was great. But interestingly enough, 2009 being a wetter year, those stubs that were pruned in March and April had a greater proportion of the laterals dying from infection as shown in the numbers in parentheses. Finally, a little bit here about uh, my work on, actually there is one more slide, sorry. So this really isn't finally, but close, we're getting close. Snow cover and ascospore maturity was an area that I investigated kind of as a, as a retrospective. When I first started in the IPM program squash mounts to determine whether ascospores of Venturia inequalis were mature, or not was a common technique. And there was argument and differences of opinion as to whether this type of technique really should go forward. Um, it is fraught with error uh, because of the subjective nature of the test. And it is difficult to do because you have to have an unsprayed susceptible orchard and have screened little mesh bags of leaves that can overwinter that you can select from to look at the pseudothesia developing in the leaf litter. But I was doing this and that first year, um, I found something very striking. Normally, 
Ascospores mature sometime around green tip, green tip of the floral buds on apples. I was finding mature ascospores at silver tip, and some of those buds were dormant even. It was snowing when I had gone out to collect the leaves, and there had been a lot of snow cover that spring. So I asked Wayne Wilcox, who was the tree fruit pathologist at the time, I said, you know, could this be related to the snow cover? And he said, I don't know, but I've got nine years of biological data you could take a look at. So we took a look at those nine years of biological data and compared them to ascospore maturity predicted by the degree day model for pseudothesial development, ascal development, and ascospore development that uses green tip as the biofix. And we got snow cover data for Geneva. And we compared all of these data. And we found that in five out of nine years when there was snow cover present, the pathogen's biology was advanced, as can be seen in this slide by this blue line, far ahead of what was predicted by the model, shown by this pink line. And these dotted lines are the 95% competence interval for that model. The green bars indicate the snow events that year, and this green arrow indicates the first ascospores found in the spore release tower. And in the other years, when there was no snow cover, basically we saw that the biological data pretty closely matched the degree day model prediction. And this is what we're looking at. We're looking at these pseudothesia developing inside the leaves that produce inside them these acai and the Venturi and Equalis ascospores that are forcibly ejected and then infect the green tissues in the spring. If a grower has one scab lesion on an apple, the value of that apple is one tenth the value of a fresh apple without a scab lesion. So you can see that the economics of that system are pretty severe. Lastly, I'll talk about my work on hummingbirds and Drosophila suzukii. These suzukii, or spotted wing Drosophila, is a little teeny fruit fly that has the ability to deposit eggs in perfect, delicious fruit. And the resulting larvae or maggots basically feed in that fruit and make it look like this. It literally drips off the receptacle of the fruit or like this. And you can see the receptacle stained with the red raspberry juice. Here's the male fly. And you can see he has a spot at the tip of each wing. Thus the common name spotted wing Drosophila. We wanted to find out whether we could attract ruby-throated hummingbirds into raspberry fields and whether that would have a measurable impact on D. suzukii abundance as measured by trap counts and egg laying as measured by fruit infestation. We attracted the ruby-throated hummingbirds with feeders and we found, yes, we can definitely attract them into our research plots. And in both sets of experiments in these plots, the second year, 2016 and 2018, saw more ruby-throated hummingbirds visiting the planting than in the first year when we set the feeders there. August was the month that had greatest abundance of hummingbirds as well. We found numerical reductions in trap counts and fruit infestation. These are the fruit infestation charts, and you can see the feeder treatment in the black bar, sorry, the no feeder treatment in the black bar and the feeder treatment in the gray bar. This gray box indicates when hummingbirds were most abundant in that field. And here you can see cumulative fruit infestation without feeders 
and the cumulative level of infestation with feeders. We found in terms of hummingbird behavior that 81% across the four years on average, 81% of the behaviors of these birds around the feeders had predatory potential. In other words, they were spending time in the raspberry plantings. They weren't just flying out of the field to the feeder and then back out again. They were actually residing in the raspberry plantings while they were feeding on the sugar solution in the feeders. And as predators, hummingbirds may have an ecology of fear effect on D. suzukii, which would reduce further feeding by the insects and their egg laying activities. I am retiring and I'm happy to say that my position in IPM is going to be available soon. I believe this job announcement is gonna go out this week. So please contact Alejandro Palixto, the New York State IPM director. If you are interested in this position, tell your graduate students and postdocs about it. It does require a PhD in plant pathology, entomology, and horticulture. I would love it if another plant pathologist got this job. And, uh, you know, it's a great, great program to work with. With that, I wanna just express special thanks to everybody here and to everyone who has contributed to the success of my programs and the impact of my work over the years. And if there's time, I'll uh, entertain any questions you might have. Thanks so much. All right, thank you for a wonderful presentation, Julie. That was really nice. <coughs> if you, excuse me, if you have questions, please post them in the chat and or raise your hand. I will do, chat questions first but if i don't see them i'll take a hand like the one from keith, keith. hello juliet thanks for the talk great fun i saw your uh, discussion of the um your time as diagnostic diagnostician uh in the 80s and those numbers of plant specimens that you were showing and it it reminded me that sometimes diagnostic diagnosticians can be overwhelmed by the numbers of samples and uh, and entertain themselves by uh, creating names for some of them. And I was wondering if you wanted to share with uh, some of the community the names you had for the, the, the massive numbers of geraniums that you got or the uh, turf um, uh, turf plugs that would come in in large number. And uh, secondarily, with regards to diagnostics, I'm just wondering your view of diagnostics uh, 40 years later and how um, that information will be delivered to people versus in the time in the past, particularly with uh, less support for diagnostic clinics and physicians and greater availability of information on the internet. So any comment on that? Yeah, sure. Uh, I apologize for my landline ringing in the back. Uh, oh, good, it stopped. Okay, great. So the geraniums, as you know, I called derangiums because we often, uh, during geranium propagation time in March, really did feel like we were going insane. Um, the turf grass samples, I always, you know, they, they would bring in these plugs and I, I really always wanted to set up a Barbie in her golf attire uh, on those and put it on display in one of those glass cases in the main hall in plant science, but I never, actually did, and I think it's because I didn't have the proper golf attire for my Barbie uh, at the time. But my technician, when, I, when, I, when that picture was taken, my, my summer technician, work study student, um, liked to make those little post-it note, like golf flags for the, for the label for those. Um, in terms of diagnostics today, you know, the, the really exciting thing are the, the molecular tests that are available that just really make it so much easier to pinpoint what you're dealing with. Um, I would take some of my fusarium isolates to uh, Hans Van Etten's research lab and have him do a mating cross so that I would know if it was solani or not. Um, I would take samples to, so, you know, researchers beware. I knew what you were working on, um, but I'd take 
some samples to uh, Peter Paleokitis to do dot plots for me, or there was an electron microscopy lab and you know they could do a dip test to see if there were virions in that. Now you've got all these you know, rapid assays for a lot of these pathogens. And I can remember um, Bob Dickey's technician, Kathy, I can't remember Kathy's last name. She went on to work for Steve Beer and I can remember her saying- Zoom off. I was, what? Zoom off. Zoom off, yes. Kathy said, I can't believe how easy it is to identify bacteria with you know, PCR. I don't have to do all these chemical tests anymore. So um, yeah, I think streamlining of diagnosis is by far uh, in a way much, much easier. But at the same time, you are more accessible to more people uh, with email. And I know Sandy has told me the number of emails they get in is, is just, it's really staggering. Oh, so, yeah. Can All I right. Go ahead, Gillian. For a second, yeah. Thank you, Julie. Um, love the hummingbird story as always. Uh, we are going to miss you, but you're not going far. And um, I appreciate your comments about then and now regarding women. It's so much easier now, but it's still not quite there, is it? No. <laughs> I, I think it's scary to take an implicit bias test. I, I will say that, even for myself. Um, I will say that in my mind, doctors are all men, for the most part, and I really have to work on that. It, it's implicit bias, and I really, really hope that a hundred years from now, that will not be the case. But even just yesterday, I was heading off to my doctor's appointment and my husband said, well, I hope he doesn't find anything wrong. And I said, she, she. <laughs> so yeah, um, I mean, it really, it, it, it was, it was, it was different being the only woman in staff meeting. And often, well, not even often, when I started the youngest person in those staff meetings. Um, I'm glad that has changed. I really, really am. So am I. Other <laughs> questions? Oh, there are some chats. My gosh, there are 10 chat questions. Ooh, well, there, most of them are just like um, accolades and thank yous, but we do have one from um, Jess. Um, any tips, uh, what to expect lists, or you'd like to give the current graduate students and postdocs that are planning to dive into the IPM world? That sounds like a fantastic question. Julie, thoughts? Okay, so if you want to get into the IPM world, a lot is getting into the mind of the grower. I can remember Wayne Wilcox telling me when I first started, you know, the faculty in IPM are about the closest to being a grower of any faculty member on this campus. And it's true because you have to, you have to be aware of every pest, you know, from deer eating an orchard to, you know, coddling moth getting into the fruit, and the larvae of the codling moth um, to scab, um, although the honey crisp is for the most part resistant to scab, so it's a pretty easy scab management thing. But the whole the whole thing is trying to think like a grower about what their challenges are and recognize that they know a heck of a lot more about growing fruit than you do, but your expertise on the side of plant pathology far outweighs theirs and they need that and they want that information from you. That, that would be my recommendation. And hey, Jess, if you're interested in applying for the job, I'd love to chat with you more about it. Um, you know, reach out to me. 
for sure. All right. Other oh, other questions or anyone want to just unmute and say anything nice? I'm sure Julie will take those as well. Oh, so people just seem to really enjoy the, the talk. It was a lot of fun. It's great yeah, career. The relative humidity work on on grapevine powdery mildew. That's that's my phytopathology paper. I think it's uh, what was it? I think it was like it's been cited 122 times. I don't know if that means anything or not. <laughs> I'm not, I'm very extension oriented people. So I don't really uh, talk in terms of citation indices and that type of thing. So I apologize. Very cool. All right, um, we can still take accolades. And if you want to um, all, you know, react uh, positively, you know, go ahead, click your reaction buttons. Thank you again, Julie, it's a fantastic talk. I will leave the Zoom open if anyone wants to continue, you know, talking and sharing things, but as far as students go, you have gotten your credit for the day. Thank you. <laughs> Excellent. I'm glad I contributed to that for you guys. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.